Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, it's so wonderful to have everybody all joining us today at this uh, event. Um, so welcome to the strategy priority in practice session of the, of the Alliance meeting. Uh, it focuses on contextualization as part of localization in refugee settings. Uh, today being a uh, World Refugee Day, it's a, it's a very pertinent uh, topic to cover. My name is Cliff. I work for UNHCR, and I'm uh, going to facilitate this event uh, together with uh, so great, wonderful speakers uh, who are joining us. Um, so just to quickly introduce uh, the speakers today, we have Amy, Amy Gabriel, who is uh, from World Vision. Uh, she has uh, over 19 years of experience in both humanitarian and development settings with expertise in child protection, programming, participation, safeguarding, and advocacy. Amy has held various uh, positions and roles in child protection, providing technical uh, leadership and support in multiple countries in Asia Pacific region over the past five years. Welcome, Amy. And uh, Amy will be joined by Jana, uh, who is an ad uh, adjunct uh, assistant professor at the Col Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Uh, she is also a lead uh, in the research unit of uh, Women, uh, Women's Refugee Co uh, Commission. And Jenna is an expert in measurement and evaluation uh, approach uh, to child protection programs and uh, has experience of over 15 years uh, supporting field teams. And uh, together, she, uh, both Amy and uh, Jenna will be joined by Job, who is joining us from Uganda. Uh, Job works for World Vision in Uganda. He has uh, 10 years of experience designing and implementing child protection in emergencies and development programs. And uh, he has previously worked for Save the Children and Plan International in uh, child protection program. Job uh, has led the establishment of uh, the child uh, friendly spaces for World Vision Uganda um, in uh, relation to the refugee influx from South Sudan. Um, so this is the, the area of topic that they will be uh, presenting today. Um, then we will move on to uh, Mara. Uh, Mara is a research practitioner with over 10 years of professional experience in child protection and forced displacement in uh, Latin America and Europe. Uh, she has worked for UNICEF, uh, the University of Edinburgh, CARE Columbia, and the refugee program of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. Uh, she has long interest in doing research to reflect uh, the child protection sector's practices and connecting that theory to practice as well. And our final speaker will be Oscar, uh, who is a lawyer from Peru, uh, and he has 15 years of experience in the field of child rights, holding positions of the Director of Special Protection and General Director of Children and Adolescents in the Ministry of uh, Women and Vulnerable Population in Peru. Uh, Oscar is currently working as a specialized consultant um, on children's rights for UNHCR Peru. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining, and uh, we really look forward to hearing you. Um, so I just wanted to quickly talk about uh, localization um, and how it's framed uh, within uh, the Alliance strategy. Uh, if we move to the next slide. So uh, as you see, uh, the Alliance uh, strategy 2021 to 2025 uh, highlights uh, localization as one of its strategic priorities. And um, this means, uh, of course, uh, the Alliance itself believes in an expanded understanding of localization and that it should guide equitable, uh, dignified, and principled humanitarian action. By this, the Alliance means addressing existing privilege and power structures in humanitarian decision-making, financing, and programming intervention. It also means working towards a mutual sharing of knowledge, skills, and opportunities uh, with an intentional shift of power. Um, so if we move to the next one, um, in, in an, and I'm sure many of you probably joined the previous session, uh, which was on uh, the celebration of the World Refugee Day. And we heard uh, a refugee actually talk about uh, the importance of ensuring refugees themselves are part of and they are leading solutions for refugees. 
this not only means local and national child protection actors, but also communities and refugee-led organizations themselves. How we promote and facilitate protection and uh, opportunities uh, for direct and flexible funding for these actors are critical for our work in localization. Uh, as you will see in the next slide, uh, the strategy of the Alliance has three specific objectives for our sector. Um, one is the meaningful participation, uh, meaningful and principled engagement of uh, communities, local actors, national actors, and recognizing them as equal partners in the development and contextualization of child protection standards and guidance, tools, and interventions. We are all used to developing all these guidance uh, in, 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 in silos, separate from uh, refugees and uh, introducing them as part of our programs. Uh, but uh, with our new objective, uh, we aim to uh, transition from this approach where we involve and ensure that uh, refugees themselves and uh, the communities uh, and children themselves are part of the solution and part of uh, the process. Um, the Alliance uh, objective also highlights the importance of creating and expanding equitable opportunities uh, to share, exchange, showcase uh, learning, knowledge, and expertise amongst refugee, local, national, and international actors. Um, be, rather than being one-sided, delivering programs and uh, learning for our own selves uh, in order to better in, uh, improve our interventions, it is important that uh, this is done together with the refugees and together with other people who are forcibly displaced and uh, ensuring that they are part of this as well. Um, and finally, uh, improving and expanding accessibility and uh, diversity in the learning opportunities that strengthen child protection, technical expertise, and grow institutional capacities is also a critical objective for the Alliance. While the three presentations, uh, through three presentations, we, uh, this will highlight some of those efforts and uh, critically examine uh, what we are doing and what we need to be doing, we encourage the participants uh, to also reflect on their own operational context, uh, consider how localization can be achieved um, within the areas where you're working. Uh, more so in that what localization actually means to the refugees, to the displaced people, uh, be they IDPs, be they uh, stateless people, and what, how it aligns to their own priorities. So while listening to each uh, speaker, um, do reflect on, uh, on on your own context, uh, do consider how the localization works and uh, needs to work in your operations as well. Um, as we listen to the speakers, I encourage you to, to, to put in your questions in the chat box, uh, which then will be posted to the presenters uh, who just spoke, uh, and uh, we'll hear more from them uh, to try to answer the question that you have. Towards the end of the, of the session, we will have a Jamboard exercise where We'll also consider what else we can be doing and what else you think uh, you should be doing uh, as you move forward in uh, ensuring that it's a community engagement, refugee engagement, and uh, it, it aligns with their own priorities and the ways they uh, feel that they need to be um, implemented in their operations. Having said that, I would like to invite uh, Amy, Jana, and Job to take the floor and talk about the work that they've done in, uh, in the refugee settlements in Uganda. Thank you so much, Cliff. And uh, myself, Jana, and Job are quite delighted to be joining you all today to talk about the findings from our multi-year study, um, country study that we did in uh, the South Sudanese refugee camp, um, together with the children, adolescents, and their communities as part of the West Nile refugee response of World Vision in Uganda. If you could go to the next slide, please. And the next slide. So for those of you who are less familiar with child-friendly spaces, the basic premise of how these interventions create change is that if you engage children in a safe and secure environment with structured activities led by trained and supported animators, then they will feel and likely be more protected. There will be more improvements in their psychosocial well-being, including the acquisition of skills and knowledge, and the community and carers around them will be motivated in support of their care and protection. 
So over the past decade, we have worked in partnership with, um, with um, various organizations, including Columbia um, University, of course, our partner in Uganda, AfriChild, and also, of course, our program team in Uganda to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, child-friendly spaces, or CFS, in its various forms across a range of um, diverse humanitarian emergencies to evolve how and when and for whom these are most effective. When we started this research over a decade ago, we were faced with a range of contextual and methodological challenges to overcome. As many of you know, CFS were and are meant to be flexible in nature to be able to respond quickly to the needs of children and their families in the acute phase of response and scale up as needed. Naturally, the activities can vary um, quite a bit across context, and thus a basic package of services had to be defined and then evaluated. The first study series um, that we did had looked at uh, particularly exploring how important quality implementation is to produce positive impacts for children, and how quality hinges upon the applications of, of skills and relationship relationships of the animators with the children. This foundational research across six different emergency contexts found that CFS overall has positive, albeit modest impacts, and particularly with regard to the psychosocial well-being and protection of children in the short term. The extent of these impacts varied by the age of the children, their gender, and whether these activities were tailored appropriately to fit local circumstances with respect to both the general context and the specific risks faced by the children. Additional explore, exploration also revealed mixed evidence as to whether these interventions have lasting benefits for children who had attended. And building on this, we launched this study, which we are now going to talk about, in a context where some of the greatest impacts were demonstrated. And this is particularly in the West Nile response in Uganda. And in this study, we sought to affirm a framework to improve and sustain mental health and psychosocial well being for children within this existing and evolving CFS interventional model. And I'll hand over to Job and then Janet to talk more about the study and the findings. Yeah, uh, next, next slide. I'm going to talk about the, the toolkit that was developed uh, with enhanced quality assurance through the new operational guidance. In the toolkit, uh, earlier CFS practice had evolved into a higher quality intervention and thus requiring additional investigation, uh, particularly around its longer impacts on the children or, or, or youth that involved in child-friendly space activities. Building on the previous findings, it was also critical to implement and evaluate a model varied package of structured psychosocial sessions uh, that may have the potential to better address this, the different needs of girls and, and boys at varying development stages. Uh, this tool, which was particularly developed in 2019 by World Vision and uh, International Federation of Red Cross, provided enhanced operational space, training manuals for implementers and facilitators, as well as activity catalog uh, featuring the different uh, uh, different sessions uh, that have been categorized into seven sequences of psychosocial themes that could be orchestrated and into four different sessions uh, throughout the lifespan of, of, of the program. And, uh, next slide. Uh, this particular research had uh, a specific objective. And uh, in this study, our, our aim was to identify the immediate and long impacts of each of these approaches. And that is currently the standard approach that is being used by most of the practitioners. And then the toolkit approach that was developed uh, on children's mental health, psychosocial well-being, and protection. And then comparing the effectiveness to each other and those receiving no intervention at all. I think we lost the connection with the job. Over to you, Amy. Sorry, can you all hear me OK? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, so I think we're still on slide five. I'm um, just going to pick up from where Job uh, was speaking to, uh, and I think he he was mentioning about the study aims, and so we basically looked at the um, both the immediate and the lasting impacts of each of the two approaches. So one looking at the standard approach, and the the other one is looking at the newer version, which is this child friendly space toolkit. 
studying both the, the, the different areas, which are the children's mental health and also the psychosocial well-being, as well as their protection, and then comparing their effectiveness to each other and to those receiving um, no intervention. So the standard approach is basically what practitioners are currently and mostly using in their work, while the toolkit is the newer one and is the more rigorous um, structured approach mentioned previously. The secondary aims of this research um, also included determining the cost effectiveness of, the, uh, of each of the service package in achieving the primary outcomes, also assessing the impact, if any, and then um, looking at the implementation of CFS have it, uh, as it has the effect on formal com and community-based child protection systems. It also looked at identifying uh, local constructs of child well-being and resilience, and also if and how these have uh, shifted over time. To achieve this, we launched a mixed method, a randomized controlled trial, assessing children and their caregivers at pre-intervention, post-intervention, and then nine months following the end of the intervention. The children were randomly assigned at baseline and then followed throughout the study period using locally validated measures and engaged in participatory activities at pre and post assessment period. So participatory activities were also used to identify the systems of support, care and protection that exist for children in response to protection concerns in their settlement. Participants were asked to identify the resource persons and institutions available for children in the settlement, including the type of service or support they provide, and also any challenges in accessing these supports. Adolescents were also asked to draw their community as they see it to learn more about how accessible these community resources are for adolescents themselves, and also areas within their community that are protective and promotive of their well being and protection. Uh, before we present the findings, we will move on um, quickly to the findings, but also we would like for you to engage and tell us about what you think of the question, which should be hopefully shown on the Jamboard on the screen. Um, and this particular question that we um, are asking is, uh, for us, is particularly relevant, um, but especially on the theme today, but also um, on one of the findings of our research, um, which was highlighted. Um, that we are also going to talk about a little bit more um, in, the, in the following slides. So please go ahead, um, share us your thoughts and tell us how you engage with local communities in particular with children and adolescents to determine what appropriate interventions can be used at the start of the response. Okay, so hopefully you should be able to manage Jamboard. If you could just click through one of the icons on the left hand side, there should be a sticky note in there where you can add your responses. Please go ahead and um, share your thoughts. And I'm going to hand over to Jenna now to um, talk more about the findings of the research. Thanks, Amy. Um, and welcome to our newest research team member who's home with a fever today. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what we found. Um, and I think we can go, we have one slide on this one. Let's see if we can find the slide. There it is. Um, so what we found in the immediate term is that both the toolkit and standard approaches led to clear positive mental health impacts for younger children. Uh, and it did have varying impacts on adolescents. The standard was more effective than the toolkit in helping to reduce psychological distress, uh, particularly for adolescent uh, ethnic minorities in the short term, as well as increase hopefulness amongst younger children and enhance individual capacities for resilience in adolescents. I think on the next slide, we'll see over the longer term, both the toolkit and standard programs led to a clear reduction in perceived risks and psychological distress. However, the toolkit was more effective in strengthening capacities for resilience. When exploring the different effects by gender, which you'll see here, uh, we found that the toolkit was particularly effective in sustaining change, especially amongst girls. Both younger and adolescent mm -hmm. girls had longer lasting improvements in mental health after attending the toolkit program. Younger girls were more resilient, while adolescent girls were buffered from using, more or from using more negative coping strategies. On the next slide, you'll see boys, where we found that younger boys in both interventions had immediate and lasting improvements in mental health. The standard approach was more effective in reducing protection concerns and daily stresses of caregivers and had longer term benefits for boys. On the next slide, and Job, are you back with us? Yes, I'm back. Great. 
Over to you. Yes, uh, among other findings, uh, the standard produced positive change among its ethnic minorities in the immediate term. Uh, meanwhile, the, the toolkit did so for long term. Here we saw an increase in the functional literacy scores for those younger children and reduced symptoms related to arousal and reactivity for adolescents. Among these adolescents, the toolkit also outperformed the standard in increasing resilience, including relational capacities for supporting it, as well as reducing psychological distress. I think when you when you also look at the care environment, uh, it's critical to mental health and well-being of children. We know that. We measured parental stress to understand further how the intervention hey. impacts its levels, if at all, and whether these were associated to any benefits for children. And we did find that female caregivers of young children attending the toolkit program reported higher levels of stress over the over the study period. And this was associated with oh. negative outcomes, such as lower levels of hopefulness as well as positive impacts, including higher levels of functional literacy and lower levels of psychological distress. Yeah, when we also did look at, uh, when we're comparing the effectiveness of uh, both standard and uh, the toolkit on community structures, I uh, realized that both programs had limited impact on strengthening community capacities for child protection and mental health and psychosocial support. Here we, we are noting that the child-friendly space lacked intentional mobilization efforts Yet the community, uh, yet the community protection system was highly interactive. And connected. The most common resource for children noted in participatory discussions were international NGOs providing a range of, of services from food to healthcare to income generating activities, including non-food items. Uh, Office of the Prime Minister, which is a government body that is re uh, regulating the functionalities of the settlements in Uganda, was frequently noted for their role in enabling access to services within the settlement. Block leaders and village chairmen were the most common community resources, resource persons reported to address children's basic and met needs, as well as acting as the key interlocutors, enhanced access to services and supporting protection, sub protection reporting mechanisms within the settlement. So let's go to the next slide. I'm, I'm conscious of time. So let's just wrap up and talk about really the main conclusions and, and findings. Um, and I think if you hold the previous decade of research and perspective, CFS works and we should use them when they're appropriate. So CFS, when implemented as a primary response strategy soon after displacement can improve the psychological health and reduce the risk environment for children Intervening soon after this displacement and then also early in the child's development provides more opportunities to develop those foundational assets and adaptive capacities that lead to lasting improvements in their health and well being. And so, as a first line response, CFS can be effective when it is tailored to the local context, the circumstances of the emergency, and diversity within the population. Also, in a protracted setting, efforts should be made as early as possible to integrate CFS into complementary services that coordinate with existing child protection and community structures to provide mental health and psychosocial services and protection services for the whole community. There's clearly more work to be done to enhance the toolkit to further improve their benefits while working to think through and evolve what the transition to, to comprehensive integrated services should be to support healthy developmental trajectories of children. And lastly, more attention needs to be paid to the inclusion of caregivers and other trusted adults or explicitly in programming to provide opportunities <clears throat> to engage in development of social and emotional learning skills, enhance communication, and reduce their own stress and its related impacts on child well-being. And so Amy, over to you. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to say thank you for listening to our presentation. Uh, it's been great also working with our team and the, of the research and the program who have been involved in the whole study, but also the community advisory board specifically who have been um, part of this whole journey with us. If you want to find out more about the research, I think we're going to be sharing a link to the uh, report as well, the summary report um, in our chat. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Amy, Jenna, and Job. Uh, that was quite uh, enlightening. Um, I don't see any, any questions in the chat, but uh, I, I do have a question uh, perhaps uh, to expand a little bit more. Um, you mentioned that 
the importance of contextualization and uh, integrating CFS into complementary services, uh, community structures, and so on. Uh, can you explain a bit further uh, how this can be done uh, to achieve effective uh, localization? Sure, I think I can start off with a couple of points and maybe also Jana and, and Job can, uh, can also um, add to it. I think firstly, one of the things that we have always been doing, and for many of us who have been working with, uh, with refugee communities, is particularly to recognize that there are capacities in the communities that, that already exist, um, even before we, you know, we, we start the programs. And I think it's really important, firstly, to scope out what community um, capacities are, are available, what community groups are actually existing, particularly, you know, for example, there will be parents groups or children, or maybe they have a, one, a way, a one way or another that they're, um, they're already communicating and, and coordinating. So it's important to engage with these groups from the very onset of programming. And I think we've heard, I think, even from the beginning of this event today, particularly listening to young people, you know, for instance, that you know, understanding their real needs and also listening to them in terms of what response might be needed is, is quite critical and, and really important for us to be effective uh, in all of this work that we are doing. Um, I think not just particularly in the implementation, it's really important to involve with these community groups, teach you know, parents, um, community leaders, and children themselves to be part of the conceptualization and the, the design of the program. Um, and, and for that, it doesn't just increase their own um, ownership, but also it also increases their capacity in the long run to be able to be um, involved in the whole response. Thanks, Amy. Um, and I do see some other questions coming in in the chat, which I uh, encourage you to try to respond in the chat itself. Uh, but uh, quite uh, quite an important point that you made in terms of uh, uh, ensuring uh, refugee communities, uh, particularly young people, are part of the uh, planning and the whole process from the outset. Of course, um, there are various challenges that we would also see, and perhaps we can touch on that uh, towards the end. Uh, where we have a um, continued influx of uh, newly arriving refugees into the same settlements uh, can pose uh, specific challenges and we need to think broadly around that. Uh, Jana, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, over to you. I yes, see your hand up. Yes, I wanted to add on to Amy's point just around the conceptualization and the localization process uh, from the research perspective is that uh, this particular piece of work we worked uh, in collaboration with a community advisory board who was quite uh, active in um, the design of the research, so um, the design and the implementation and what it is that we were actually looking at as a measure of success for this particular intervention. Um, so, and that we found um, has been incredibly rich and um, and helpful in ensuring that the findings of the research are taken up and, and moved forward. So over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, Jenna. Um, so we have uh, Mara online who is going to talk to us about her experience of uh, localization, conceptualization as well uh, in the context of Mexico. Um, so by thanking Amy, Job, and uh, Jana, I hand it over to Mara to come on. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Mara, and I, I will be presenting on some lessons learned, some mistakes, some things that I would I like to do better in contextualizing a guide for the foster care of children um, living in Mexico. So foreign children living in Mexico, usually awaiting for their asylum status to be issued. So next slide, please. So this is a 10 minute presentation between 10, 10 and 11 minute presentation. I am not going to present the guide itself and, or the the, the outcome, let's say, of the research, but the research process and mainly the lessons learned and mistakes, as I said before, with the point of uh, emphasizing on the importance of decolonizing the way in which we, um, we create knowledge in our sector. My video stopped and I don't know why, if anyone wants, in the, in We've had the to, we were having connection okay. problems, so I needed to fix it so we could hear you. Please continue. Okay, I continue speaking. Okay, so um, 
I am not very good at storytelling, but story time. A couple of weeks ago, I was at an event, a very high level political event for the Americas. Many, many parallel events on migration and protection, including asylum, refugees, so what to do to improve their living conditions in the Americas, so in Latin America, plus the US and Canada. Many high level representatives from international organizations saying that refugees need to be included in the response, asylum seekers need to be included in the response, et cetera, et cetera. Zero refugees inside in those events. So um, I wanted to make the point that even though in, a, in this specific sector, so humanitarian aid, research that includes affected populations advance very fast. I think that it, the, the inclusion of these populations has improved a lot in the past years. This is not the case with adjacent um, sectors like policy making, for example, or the making of regional policies or academia too. And I think it is important not only to try to change our sector itself and the way we do things, but also connect these sectors that um, affect what we do. So that is the point of my presentation. Um, the guide, you can get it online. I make sure that it is uploaded everywhere where you get your research. It is only available. It seems like we have lost uh, connection to uh, Mara. Um, so we... So I am here, but ah, you're here. Okay. My, my connection problem, okay? There's something wrong on the other side. My connection it's, is perfect. I, I live in Silicon fine. Valley, by the way. <laughs> so my connection is really high quality. Ah, there I am again. I am okay. here again. Over to you. So next slide, please. If we can change the slide. Good. So if we change um, or if we divide knowledge creation uh, in different um, stages, let's say, this is the stage of the need for the guide. The guide completely answered a need from practitioners and frontline workers in Mexico. That is that during the past year, especially since, two, so since 2011, but especially since 2014, Mexico completely reformed its policies, its legal framework and policy framework concerning uh, the care and protection of children in mixed movements, which means that also practices need to improve. What goes on now in Mexico is that, so Mexico for those who come from other regions is a country of destination, of transit, a country of origin too, and a country of uh, deportation. So basically a lot of movement going on in the same country. This guide is specifically, as I said before, for those children who are awaiting for their uh, international protection status, so refugee status or, or asylum to be decided upon by the authorities. Also, I forgot to say something because of the technical issues. Please, I want to know about you. So if you would be so nice to write, to write on the chat, on the chat box here on Zoom, what your connection is to localization, where you do localization from. So do you work at a large organization? Do you work at a university? Do you work from Europe? Do you work from the field? I am interested in knowing this. And of course, any questions that you have, pose them, because I want to know what you think about all of this. So next slide. So the guy completely uh, answered the need of, um, okay, and I, I see that we only have this in Spanish, but no problem, because I will say it in English and the translators can, can translate it. As I said before, I want to know about you, we want to know about you. And I have three specific questions. One of them, your thoughts about localization and contextualization when it comes to the production of knowledge. So tools, guides, handbooks, policies, uh, programming that is used across many departments of an organization. So this is what I mean by knowledge production or producing knowledge. 
and this type of knowledge that is then used for policy, for programming across many organizations or across many departments of the same organization. I hope that I am clear. So I am not talking about projects. I am talking about more or less between quotation marks, higher level uh, tools and guides. If you have any, any opinions about that, I would like to know them or any advice or anything that you have learned in your work. Next slide, please. Second question that you can answer if you want, always on the chat box is um, who should be involved or whom you have seen that is not involved enough. Priority number two of the strategic priorities of the Alliance talks about involving populations that are normally marginalized. Um, in my region where I work, so Latin America, it is usually indigenous peoples, black descendants, so people from the African diaspora living in the Americas, and the LGTBI, also people from poorer uh, backgrounds and so on and so forth. So I wanted to know what your, your experience is on that. Third question, you don't need to answer everything. I know this is a little bit overwhelming. Uh, what means you have used this? Don't worry, you can answer this directly on the Jamboard that um, World Vision shared before. So what methodologies have you used in the past to ensure participation by these populations that are usually marginalized from knowledge production? That was my third question. So next slide, please. So some challenges that I found while creating these guides were that we don't have standards in Latin America for foster care programs for children in mixed movements or children and accompanied and separate children, children living abroad. I created this guide for UNICEF and RELAF, as you could see in, in the previous slides. Um, they have a lot of experience, of course, together they have decades of experience working in alternative care for children in general, but in particular, no foster care program for children in these movements have been created in Mexico. When I started drafting the guide, which was in 2017, there were some isolated practices. And of course, there's always the informal practice of foster care, which is very common in Latin America, but there was no institutionalized foster care program. So I needed to look for examples in Europe. And of course, all the time I was asking myself how to make these standards, these guides, these practices that were developed in either some European Union countries, I also used examples from the UK and from Norway into the Latin American context. Um, I see two different problems here. The number one, the way in which we produce, not, we have produced knowledge in our sector. And as I mentioned before, in other sectors, this is not endemic to humanitarian aid. This is a problem that we have in academia also policy making, development, the development sector, etc. That is that we have extremely strong legacy of colonialism and imperialism. So usually knowledge is, is produced in a way that is top down. There's usually a university or an agency or a think tank or a research center based in the north that works on knowledge production in the global north usually placed in a, or located in a colonial country or former colonial country. So how do we deal with all of this? How do we make sure that the tools and the guys that we create continue being relevant for the populations that they are going to benefit? Even if our knowledge, our knowledge production practices are the way they are and that we are trying to improve, and still we have a lot of these legacies that that I am talking about. And then also, how do we define local? I know that, uh, so the Alliance is using the words, uh, words local, national, regional, and I like that very much because the word localization doesn't, so doesn't speak to the truth that many times we work in extremely, extremely complex countries. In the case of Mexico, Mexico has to, <laughs> 200 million inhabitants or more um, 
32 states, Mexico is a very cosmopolitan, diverse country. It is a mixture of indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant peoples, and uh, migrants and refugees also. So it is a very complex country. So what does uh, local, local means in that context? These, are, these were very important questions for me to answer while drafting the guide. Next slide, please. Ah, okay, and of course, how to achieve local ownership. So all of these uh, reflections and concerns uh, ended up being in that the, there was a lot of back and forth with the UNICEF National Office, UNICEF Mexico, country office, especially with the child protection officer that is directly in touch with foster care programs. So that works very, very um, closely with the foster care program from the DIF, that is the Child Protection Services, Family Welfare Services in Mexico, completely decentralized. Of course, as I said before, Mexico has, has 32 states and has one office, one child protection office per state besides the federal one, the national one. So this is extremely decentralized. This is why it was so important to have continuous uh, feedback loops with UNICEF Mexico. So this is me, basically. This is me uh, trying to explain the research process because it took uh, one year in total. So it was this, this so January 2017, September 2018, but it was not, con not continuous. So I was not working on this all the time. But it took a lot of time because we needed to have these continuous loops. Me being in Europe, because I was based in Europe, in UNICEF country office in, U in Mexico, of course, being in constant con um, exchanges with the foster care programs. So this, this was really, really important for local ownership, national ownership, and for the guide to be completely relevant to practice in Mexico. So next slide, please. Okay, so mistakes and lessons learned. Mistake number one that I totally, um, that I know that we were in the wrong, let's say, um, was that we didn't involve any asylum seeking or children on, on, in these movements in general in the creation of the guide. I relied a lot on the experience of, UN of the UNICEF country office staff who are in direct contact with children. And also on all of these uh, European guys that were created based on children's experiences. But of course, this doesn't replace speaking with children. And uh, from this moment onwards, so from September 2018 onwards, I, I am very concerned and very, very worried about, I'm very uh, mindful that we need to involve. So what the presenter from World Vision and Columbia University were saying before, involving children, not only to ask for feedback or to ask for inputs, but also uh, in the conceptualization and the design of the research. This is very important. Um, and involving them systematically. And then another important point that I want to, to finish with is uh, what I started basically, uh, that is the decolonization of the way we produce knowledge. There are all of these groups that have been historically, historically marginalized and excluded from the production of knowledge. Those of us who study social sciences know this very well because we study that when we are at university. So how did social sciences uh, start? They started by white men from Europe going to their colonies. Uh, this is a legacy that we have. This is something that we need to fight against. Democratizing knowledge creation. Democratizing, this is a word. Knowledge creation. The production of knowledge needs to be democratized. It needs to be um, popularized. So the groups that have been historically excluded, as I said before, need to be included from the conceptual, the conceptual phase of the research. If um, research centers, universities, etc., are not prepared to do so, they need to change the, the structures. They need to change the way they do things. 
this uh, will take a very long time. <laughs> the same policy making, as I said before, a very important uh, migration and protection agreement was signed in this region, the Americas, last week with no participation from migrants and refugees. This is extremely wrong. We all understand this, and this needs to change. So this is my call for action for this presentation, that everyone who can do a little from their universities or research centers, or maybe their offices that are located in the headquarters of their organizations, and contribute to uh, the democratization and the decolonization of the production of knowledge. And this is it. This is my presentation. Okay. I want to continue this conversation, of course. So if you have any questions or comments, complaints, suggestions or claims or anything that you want to share with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. I am very active on LinkedIn. So Mara Tisera Luna is my name, or I can leave my email here. And please write to me because this is something that concerns all of us that we all need to try to improve. But there are some of you or some of us that have more power to improve this than others. And I would like you to be involved in this. So thank you very much. Thank and you, Mara. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so for much. Your Thank you so much. Uh, that was a very uh, interesting and uh, reflective uh, presentation on uh, contextualizing something that was created in a, in a different context uh, to a Mexican context. Um, I do see a question, perhaps I can post this for you uh, in the chat uh, where uh, Laurent is saying a very interesting issue uh, that you are raising wondering whether there were efforts um, to research local national practices regarding care for unaccompanied and separated children and research methodologies to do this. Um, we have like uh, two minutes, uh, if you can cover that and then ca carry on the conversation in the chat. Yeah, of course. Um, so as I said before, I, I am the researcher, so I am an independent researcher. I created this research for UNICEF and the Latin American Network for the Right to Live in a Family, RILA. Together, both of them have many decades of researching on national practices, national, local foster care practices. And of course, this was part of the guide. Uh, those of you who don't read in English, you won't be able to, sorry, in Spanish, it is in Spanish because it is localized. In Latin America, we speak Spanish, so of course it is in Spanish. Apart from Brazil and, and the Caribbean countries, we all speak Spanish and this is from Mexico. So this is the, um, the way it was. So yes, it included the experiences, so that I didn't do research on these experiences because the, there's already other research published by RELAF and UNICEF on local and national foster care practices. And as I said a couple of times, the problem uh, when I started drafting the guide was that there was no institutionalized foster care program for children in mixed movements. So this specific thing didn't exist, but there's a very, there's a very well institutionalized and very well developed foster care program in Mexico in general for all, for all children let's, who need to participate or to, who need alternative care, let's say. So the, yeah, this exists and this was taken into consideration for this guy and it is part of the guy too. Hmm. Thank you, Mara. Thank you so much. Um, so we, we can revisit some of these points uh, when we uh, bring it all together in the Jamboard uh, towards the end of the session, um, conscious of the time as well. So uh, we have next speaker, Oscar. Oscar who, uh, works uh, as a consultant for UNFCI in Peru. Uh, so he's going to talk about the experience of uh, contextualizing and uh, localization uh, in, in the context of uh, child protection in Peru. Over to you, Oscar. Thank you, Cliff. <clears throat> and good day for everybody. I'm in Lima now, so it's good morning for, from this side of the world. Uh, well, I'm Oscar. I'm pleased to be here in this presentation. Um, the previous presentation of my uh, colleagues is going to uh, are very useful for the specific topic I'm going to talk about, and it's the Peruvian experience specifically the child protection system uh, to, face, to face the special needs of children on the move. So uh, we are going to give a little context in the next slide. We can see uh, a few bullet points uh, because this is a new 
situation to face in this country, in Peru. Uh, since 2019, we have, a, le, le, let's say, a, bear, an increased movement of persons, especially uh, people coming from Venezuela. And early statistics from 2021 um, says that we have uh, 1 million, 1.2 million people in Peru. So Peru is a middle income country with a lot of disparities and of course not prepared to face this type of situations. Uh, in Peru, the Ministry of Women and Vulnerable Populations is the national authority of the child protection service and the system. Uh, so to give you just uh, some numbers to uh, see the, the dimension of this challenge, uh, only between 2018 and 2021, um, the child protection system of Peru uh, attend 2,420 cases. Uh, and, and as I said, everything was new for the child protection system with no protocol for this topic, only, only general considerations. They were working, applying uh, the principles of the best interest of the child and non-discrimination uh, because there was uh, no option for the child protection system to exclude this specific group of children. But this, child, this group of children has uh, special needs, as we would see in a few minutes. Uh, the practice of the alliance that I, I want to highlight to you is this agreement between uh, UNHCR, Peru, and the Ministry of Women and Vulnerable Population, because in 2021, they uh, realized that this is a long-term process. Um, and it has to be uh, that we need an instrument um, to support this agreement, because here in Latin America, and I know in other parts of the world, uh, the political changes changes are very quick. So maybe something that uh, an NGO or a, a UN um, office agree with an authority, maybe the next week or the next month, uh, they are not there anymore. So it's like a starting again. So these type of agreements are very useful in these type of countries. So as we can see in the next slide, uh, uh, the agreement between the Ministry of Women and Vulnerable Populations and UNHCR uh, has two, um, two activities that I want to highlight. First, to build a specific protocol for the child protection service uh, because it was required. Uh, because it was very new for all the professionals, all the teams. So uh, one of the decisions is to build a, a specific protocol, which is in, uh, it will be approved in the, in, in the coming months. And the other situation is uh, the training of the, of the teams. But uh, first of all, both teams, the UNHCR Peru team and the, and the team of the Ministry of Women and Vulnerable Population realized that we are under a very specific situation for this group of children, as we can see in the diagram. Uh, in the middle, we have the children, which, which is the, uh, the way that all child protection services have to work, but we need to realize that uh, not only the, um, the regulations or the, uh, or I mean the, um, the obligations, of the Convention of the Rights of the Child are the only ones to apply it. Because as we can see here, we have also state obligations uh, which are a part of the international, um, international law for, uh, for refugees and also the very general fundamental uh, obligations uh, part of the human rights uh, system. So we need child protection uh, professionals in line with all these three aspects. Plus other ones, because if we have uh, adolescent women, indigenous and uh, with special needs, uh, adolescent, as I said, uh, we need to add extra uh, obligation of the state. So that's the main challenge for, this, um, uh, for these uh, professionals. So, to give a very useful hand to these teams because they have a big amount of, of cases every day. So we need like very like easy, easy documents, easy, easy training programs and more. We, 
develop, um, or we ask them to have a systematic approach inside the child protection system, as we can see in the next slide. So we prepared this, uh, this chart to help them to uh, reach this approach. Um, the traditional uh, attention in the child protection system in Peru is, uh, is more or was more focused about considering the presence of family plus the, the general approach of the child protection system, which is uh, to uh, analyze the family and social context and, and conclude if they have or not parental health. But as we can see in the next columns of the chart, there are very important aspects these, uh, these teams need to realize when they are attending uh, a case in the, in the first line service. The need of international protection, which is fundamental because we have a specific and mandatory obligations if we are talking about refugee children. Uh, also, the, the aspects of nationality and also the immigration documents, because it is an obligation in the case of Peru um, to, to promote the regulation of the immigrant situation of all these children. You know? But we are at this point, I can say it very quickly, that we have all the uh, general regulations and, and mandatory um, obligations assumed by the international uh, uh, treaties but we don't have all that uh, aspects um, implied by the first line uh, professionals. So that's the, the main uh, challenge for this intervention. So in the next slide, uh, instead of giving you conclusions, considering that we are in an ongoing process, uh, we separated short-term and medium-long-term challenges. In the short term is also, as I mentioned, continue the training of the interdisciplinary teams of this uh, child protection service, considering that in all countries, uh, the high uh, level of mobility of the services. We train one group of professionals today, and in six months, we have new people there. So we need uh, to build um, uh, a training process considering this aspect. Also, uh, this alliance between the UNHCR Peru and the Minister of Women and Vulnerable Populations uh, needs to be replicated by other authorities related with, this, uh, with, the, with the rights of the child, like health, education, immigration, uh, etc. In the medium long term, uh, we uh, conclude or, or we are aware that we need to promote legis legislative modifications. You know? Uh, because uh, we have to um, put all the national uh, regulation in line with the international agreements that the per that Peru already signed. So we need to we have the the base for for this process. And also, in the medium long term, we need to advocate uh, for the allocation of resources because a uh, good child protection service needs professionals. Uh, need um, financial resources. You know? So we need to be aware that it's not only the protocol of the training that will solve the problem. We also need to be aware about the administrative and also the human resource, human resources, sorry, uh, implication for this, uh, for this service. Um, just to finish in the, in the last slide, uh, I will leave you with a question. Maybe I will start with this, but I decided to put it at the end because uh, this is something uh, the uh, it's not um how I say, it's not an equation. I cannot say I have the solution for this. So we need to think, considering our specific context, um, which challenge which challenges I identify in my home country uh, for this group of children uh, in the in considering with their particular vulnerable situation. So uh, all child protection services in all around the world, maybe uh, are not facing today this type of, um, of cases, but uh, we need to learn by the experience of Peru uh, that you need to be prepared. 
all child protection services need to be prepared for this type of, uh, of cases because from one month to the other, we, in 2018, we started to receive this type of cases and the child protection system wasn't prepared. So uh, let's learn everybody for that. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Oscar. Uh, it's a very interesting approach uh, in terms of, again, contextualizing engagement of the national systems in, uh, in providing uh, protection to children on the, uh, in mixed movement and uh, refugee children themselves. Um, there is a question in terms of uh, the possible role of the Alliance uh, Advocacy Working Group uh, in, uh, in your advocacy efforts to uh, increase funding for uh, child protection. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that, and I would like to also come back with another question more about um, the, the role of the refugee or uh, persons on the move themselves in this whole process. Yes, thank you, Cliff. I want to um, highlight the comment about the, the funding because uh, it is very important. It's not the, it's one element like the, the rest of the others, you know, like the training, like the specific protocols, and, and more. And I can suggest, suggest, sorry, from the Peruvian experience that this alliance between uh, the, the UN uh, agency like UNHCR and the child protection system um, uh, give a technical assistance and also is a strength for the, in this case, the minutes of women and vulnerable population to go to the, uh, to the budgeting authority of the country and say, see, this, this uh, topic or this problem is, uh, is urgent and we, and we, are, and we have these uh, agreements and sometimes these meetings or, or this advocacy uh, is uh, accompanied by also the UNHCR um, office of the country. So um, this is like a tip, let's say, <laughs> if I'm going to say it in a very uh, a colloquial way, but um, the having um, having a strategy alliances also reflects not only in technical assistance uh, but also in the opportunity of budgeting and for your um, from the other part of the question cliff um yes i i absolutely agree that uh, all the um, refugee the, the representation of the refugee um, persons and needs to be present and, and and i want to say that during the construction of this protocol uh, we consulted and we involved refugee organizations here in Peru, specifically uh, a few of them uh, 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 headed by Venezuelan people, uh, because they know what's a problem. And also they can involve themselves into the solution. I was uh, listening to Mara's presentation and we were talking about that uh, the last, uh, a few days ago during a, during a training uh, session. Um, this uh, refugee uh, Venezuelan organization said, well, I want to be part also of, we want to be part of the solution. We have a group of adult persons settled in Peru with the opportunity and also uh, apply uh, for foster care because they, they, uh, they can uh, fit all the requirements. So in that way, I guess that's a very good example of how this person, this group of people integrated in the country also could be part of the solution for the uh, children without parental custody. So back to you, Cliff. Thank you so much, Oscar. Um, thanks uh, to all the speakers. Uh, it was very uh, important points that were touched upon, uh, both uh, starting, of course, with uh, Amy, Jana, and uh, Job, who talked about um, the, the role of child-friendly spaces and uh, the impact this can still have and the importance of this, uh, and uh, also reflecting on uh, the need for uh, how uh, communities are engaged in this process from the outset. Uh, Mara uh, spoke about uh, the contextualization, the need for democratizing uh, knowledge and uh, the engagement of um, information from uh, the local practices as well, the way um, uh, solutions uh, in terms of alternative care is in uh, practice and how we need to build on that as well. And Oscar, you, you spoke about uh, the role of uh, uh, the national child protection systems in, in essential need to uh, strengthen uh, these processes uh, in order to 
uh, ensure uh, the services are aligned with the needs of uh, refugees and children on the move. Um, we do have a kind of continue the conversation uh, through a Jamboard activity, but I just have a few points to kind of expand upon, uh, especially when we talk about uh, refugee context. Of course, we heard from uh, uh, the context in Uganda, we talk, uh, heard from uh, the Mexican example, and as well as uh, the example from Peru. Uh, but also, uh, it's uh, important for us to keep in mind that uh, refugees themselves face multitude of barriers in terms of uh, their ability to participate and engage and uh, be uh, the owners of programs. Um, this may be uh, due to uh, different legal constraints in uh, the ability to move uh, within uh, the country where they are, uh, the right to work and so on uh, does uh, pose specific challenges. Um, we touched upon this also uh, earlier, uh, while we build programs in refugee context, uh, be it an urban setting or in a, uh, in a, in a settlement or a camp setting, um, new emergencies, new influx of refugees means that uh, the programs need to be adaptable uh, in order to ensure uh, newly arriving refugees and their views and their needs are also considered in terms of how we localize our programs. They're part of this process in, in a way. Um, and, and also uh, we need to think in terms of how localization links with and contributes to durable solutions overall. Uh, Amy mentioned the importance of uh, starting at the outset uh, of engaging with uh, uh, with communities, knowing, understanding their priorities in terms of uh, their ownership and how we perceive uh, what refugee owned and refugee led processes uh, would be. So that conversation and uh, interaction is quite critical. And here it's uh, not goes uh, goes without saying the uh, the voices of children, adolescents, uh, those who are soon to transition to adulthood are, are quite vital. Um, and then we need to also recognize, I guess, uh, that when we talk about refugee population, um, uh, population of uh, persons on the move, um, and mixed movement, and so on, is that it's not a one group of people. There are varying uh, concepts, varying uh, understanding of what their rights are or what their what they, uh, priorities are. Um, we have uh, LGBTIQ plus people. Um, we have different ethnic groups within the same refugee population. So when we talk about uh, localization, what do we mean? Who's, how do we ensure that these diverging views and opinions and uh, needs are also reflected in our program um, and, and ensure that uh, not only voices are heard, but there is this ongoing process of, uh, of uh, transfer of power, the, the transfer of approach in terms of, uh, of uh, democratization, as, uh, as Mara said. Um, having said that, uh, and with, uh, with these uh, points also, just wanted to share with you a, a Jamboard and hear from you, um, what do you think uh, would be, I mean, if you can bring up the Jamboard, please. So uh, yeah, exactly. So based on what you have heard, uh, what would you do differently? And uh, how would you tackle the issue of localization, ensure that prior, uh, transition in, in power between humanitarian actors and local communities uh, can look. Uh, so we'll be interested to hear what your thoughts are, how you would think uh, we can go forward, um, and, and uh, then we open for a conversation as well. So perhaps while we, while we wait for uh, the participants to contribute to the Jamboard, uh, perhaps invite uh, Oscar, Mara, Amy, uh, Jana and Job uh, to speak a little bit more about uh, um, this contextualization and localization, especially in a volatile refugee context. Can I make one comment? Go ahead, Mara. Yes, yeah, so uh, I saw your comment saying like, my organization does this, my organization does this. Yes, I know we are on a talk on localization. <laughs> at the annual meeting of the Global Alliance, okay? My message is not, is not addressing you. What I say is please let's all join our forces and advocate so that everyone, so all of the decision makers that have a stake in involving populations in decision-making, knowledge creation, especially 
involve marginalized populations. As I said before, and okay, Oscar talked a little bit about this, governments are not super interested in doing this as we know, okay? So uh, both groups in many Latin American countries, children and asylum seekers, refugees, people on the move are the least priority because the, the, they are not the constituencies of our governments as we all know, and this happens in all countries, not only Mexico or Peru or Argentina. So this was my call for action. And I know that everyone works really hard here for to achieve localization for real effectively. So my message was not for you. Don't feel offended. Uh, my message is for us to advocate for everyone to do what, what we are trying to do, basically. Thank you, Mara. Uh, and I see a few uh, points uh, shared in the comments uh, in, in, the, in the Jamboard. Uh, one participant mentions that uh, intentional capacity building of local groups and partners. Um, and uh, I also see include advocacy from the outset uh, in programming, and this uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, the role of uh, refugees, uh, role of uh, displaced communities, role of affected population uh, and children that we work with, um, investing consulting uh, communities and uh, simple research. Uh, is, is another key point that is raised. Um, and I think uh, perhaps we can uh, highlight uh, also uh, in your work, uh, Amy, Jana, and Job, and uh, Mara as well, as um, I see Oscar's hand up, uh, how uh, some of these comments can be uh, incorporated or next step at least. Uh, Oscar, over to you since you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, Cliff. Um, yes, um, well, I want to like add a little extra tip, let's say, to, uh, to um, according to the localization approach that you mentioned. And it's that uh, we are thinking about child protection uh, systems. We also need to take into consideration uh, where these service is working. Because in the case of Peru, we have a child protection service, but with 25 offices around the country. So we need to know where the uh, be, the, the, where the people are, let's say. No? For example, a person from Venezuela are located the majority in Lima, in the specific districts of Lima in the north area, uh, but also we have in this topic a specific uh, spot for this uh, situation, which is the uh, north borderline of Peru, between Ecuador and Peru, because people walk from Venezuela to Peru, crossing Colombia, crossing Ecuador. So the natural enter for them is our north uh, border, which is a little bridge. And if you want to pass the immigration office, uh, you do. And if you don't, you walk uh, 500 meters uh, to the west, and then you cross the borderline. So we, are, we have very open borderlines here in Latin America. So uh, I guess that's also um, uh, something necessary for the child protection system. Don't, yes, you need like national regulation, but also you need to um, land specific uh, strategies uh, for a specific regions or provinces or districts inside the country. Thank you, Oscar. Um, and I see also a very you know, important point around ensuring ethnic, linguistic, and other minorities are involved in the response. Um, also, uh, not to mention the, the role of children and their voices. Perhaps uh, I'll ask uh, Amy and uh, Jana, uh, Job, in your, in your work in Uganda, um, how did we, did, was there an issue around uh, the linguistic uh, diversity of uh, different uh, groups of refugees? And what would be some other ways to, uh, to ensure that uh, different voices are heard and there is a, a kind of a cohesive way forward? Yes, uh, thank you, Cliff. Uh, I've been following the discussions keenly. And um, just to first respond to the first question, what would we do differently? And um, to build on what Jana said, I think it's important to, to appreciate the fact that uh, the refugee population have, have a potential uh, to make sure that they are highly involved right from the design of the programs and uh, the different structures within the community are resource themselves. 
and making sure that the different structures within the community are highly involved uh, in implementing child friendly space and child protection programs. Uh, we have had situations of donor projects coming in and going off, uh, reduced funding and all that, but empowering the communities, working with the communities, will actually not only yield uh, the desired impact, but also creates an opportunity for sustainability, but also en en uh, enhances the participation of community members uh, during the programming. Yeah, uh, in Uganda, it, it, it has been, um, we have had good strides towards inclusion of, of multilinguistic communities uh, while accessing services. And uh, yes, from, from the time of settling, uh, settling the refugees or persons of concern, also asylum seekers, they are put in specific locations where they are able to speak specific languages. Uh, we know that we are highly um, hosting refugees from South Sudan, and most of the, the, the war in South Sudan has highly been caused by tribal conflicts. That means uh, when they come to Uganda, we are very mindful in ensuring that um, they are put in specific locations and their opportunities in terms of leadership, in terms of representation of all the different, uh, different tribes uh, to make sure that we take care of all the all the tribes that 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 are settled within Uganda, we we have had situations where the minority groups have actually been left out uh, because of the numbers. Uh, if the minority group, if we have a few children participating in in a child friendly space activities, we find that sometimes we don't have a translator uh, to take care of such needs. But we have also been very deliberate in, in, in the toolkit in ensuring that we have all the categories catered uh, in terms of having the child-friendly space animators or facilitators uh, from different tribes so that they are able to, to facilitate learning uh, for all the children uh, from the different tribes from South Sudan. That's one way that we have been uh, able to ensure that all the children with different ling linguistic needs are taken care of. Thanks, Job. Thanks. Um, and I see another point here, invest in consulting communities and uh, simple research. So we appreciate the diversity of views and don't assume on their behalf. Um, I was wondering, uh, perhaps just to expand on that, uh, to, to hear and build on the views of children themselves as part of the localization uh, process. Um, I would be quite keen to hear if uh, anybody in the in the speakers panel uh, might have any thoughts on how we can do it better. What, what would be the role of children in the localization process itself? Because we need to recognize when we talk about localization, again, it's it seems like an imposed uh, approach, right? We're talking about we are going to do localization rather than ensuring that uh, that it, it, uh, the process itself relates to and uh, and uh, aligns with the views of uh, of people. Uh, so perhaps uh, I'll ask Mara and then uh, Oscar to come in. Yeah. So community-based decision-making mechanisms or popular mechanisms already exist in many countries, in many regions. And like me and Oscar, we come from a particularly politically mobilized region. So usually there's a neighborhood club or somewhere, somewhere where people meet. Also, someone uh, wrote here on the Jamboard in Spanish, uh, strengthening the, com the community committees, because in many countries, there's also this model, Mexico is one of them, of community committees, uh, child protection committees. So I would say like number one already, so uh, cooperating with structures that are already in place. It is not like no refugee community has ever organized themselves. It is the opposite. So look for those organized ways of organizing that maybe are not Western looking like, let's say, like you call them somewhere in some somehow, but that also do the same, so serve the same purpose of dialogue and debate, community debate and decision-making. 
So I would say that, and the committees, these committees comunitarios that someone mentioned uh, are an example of that. Thank you so much, Mara. Uh, Oscar? Yes, um, I want to share an example uh, about how um, apply uh, the participation is not easy as it seems. For example, here in Peru, uh, in the case of the, of the emergency with Venezuela, um, in some, in a lot of cases, we have adolescents, boys or girls, attended by the child protection system. Um, they want to go back to their country, but they have the status of refugees in Peru. So, as a state, you have the obligation, but well, well, applies the principle of non refoulement So, how do you balance that? So, for that type of situations, a part of the of, of also take into consideration the. Uh, the voice and the view of the adolescent in this case, you have to make a um, best interest of the plan, of the child, sorry, a balance. You, you need to apply that principle because uh, we we need to, we have two like uh, very strong uh, aspects to balance. So uh, that's uh, quite a challenge for the, for the child protection uh, professionals and authorities. Thank you so much. Uh... Oscar. Um, just to look at here. Um, uh, so I, I think that just to take the last point here, uh, uh, less agency driven in community based or community led uh, level work, and more focus on community led child protection. Um, how I mean, it's something that, of course, we can recognize cannot be done overnight, right? There needs to be a process because um, the, the way in some respects, communities have come to expect uh, a response from humanitarian actors versus the way humanitarian actors have been working for uh, for years and years. Uh, there needs to be a bridge. So I'm, I'm wondering if anybody had any reflections on how that what that bridge would be, and if anybody wants to even propose how much time it would take and uh, what would be the way forward uh, based on the research and the work that you've done. If I could just add one quick thing, I think, uh, Cliff, um, I think one thing that has been um, alluded to, but also mentioned in some of the conversations was really about the importance of having accountability mechanisms. Um, and we do, I think there's intention often in terms of consulting children, communities, and, you know, adolescents, for instance, when we do design, but often the ongoing contextualization and localization work um, has to be more intentional. And I think the function of the accountability mechanisms, whenever we put in place, um, you know, um, feedback, community feedback mechanism, this has to be, of course, accessible to the community's children themselves, but also the input coming from the children and the feedback coming from the children must also be considered, listened to, and taken on board whenever we looked at how we are adapting and adjusting programs. There also is an importance I think that needs to be made, the, a highlight that needs to be made around the, import, the, the, um, the role of um, our ongoing monitoring and evaluation work. Uh, and I think always there, has, there, there is a way of finding out what children are saying, what children are feeling, what children are actually, um, how children are receiving the interventions and, and, and then how their, their feedback can be used when it comes to further uh, improving our programs and improving future interventions as well. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and thanks, everyone. Uh, we're almost coming to the end, and I just thought I'll kind of highlight a few points. Uh, uh, so we started off by talking about the Alliance's uh, strategic priority for localization. Uh, we uh, stressed on the point around sharing and shifting power, influence, and leadership with community, local, and national child protection actors. Uh, we talked about uh, the importance of um, looking at the opportunities for direct and flexible funding for local uh, communities, um, national organizations working on child protection as well. Um, the, what does it mean in terms of uh, way uh, of working? Um, it set up uh, three objectives uh, in the Alliance strategy, uh, meaningful and principled engagement of communities in the process as equal partners in the process as well. Um, it's also about 
the extent to which and the ways that we work towards ensuring uh, the development and contextualization of our global uh, standards, guidance, tools, and so on, um, are reflective of uh, the priorities set by by the communities, by the, the population themselves. Um, and, and it's important that we talk about uh, ensuring uh, accessibility and uh, diversity of learning opportunities. And we heard from um, Amy, Job, and uh, and Jana about the research that they've done in relation to uh, child-friendly spaces, the impact on children, and the possibility and the opportunities for further engagement of communities and uh, community ownership in this regard. And Mara talked about uh, the particular pitfalls of trying to uh, adapt a, 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 a kind of procedures that are developed in one context to a different context. And uh, it's, a, it's a critical way, critical process uh, where we need to think in terms of what already exists in the community, what already exists in the national systems and so on. And Oscar uh, spoke uh, much more about uh, that uh, adaptation into national systems as well. And I wanted to leave you uh, all with the uh, and uh, the reflection on how do we ensure localization of uh, child protection programming in a context where there's continuous uh, emergencies, uh, new influxes of refugees, and diverse groups of refugees uh, where um, different uh, groups of uh, uh, marginalized groups of refugees may not have the same voice as a different uh, group of refugees that are uh, the majority within a community as well. So uh, there's a lot to think about and a lot to reflect on as we work towards this process of localization. And having said that, again, I want to thank uh, Amy, Job, Jana, uh, Mara and Oscar for uh, their contributions and uh, also the contribution and the questions asked in the chat by the participants um, and, and uh, also uh, the hard work done uh, to prepare these presentations and uh, in production of this, uh, of this session. So with that, I thank everyone and I hope it was a useful uh, experience for everyone who was here. The conversation shall continue and uh, yeah, looking forward to a future chat on this topic. Thank you very much, Cliff. Thank you, and Ahmad. Thank you all to all of the speakers. I'm David, I'm one of your producers. I'm just here to remind you now that you can move into the Philo uh, uh, link now where you will have the chance to check out some of the infographic discussion sessions which are available to you there. So thank you very much indeed for attending uh, such a useful session and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. And please also complete the feedback form in the chat box thank if you, you haven't seen it. <laughs> thank yes, thank you for that reminder. The chat box has got everything that you need. There's a feedback form there. You'll also find a copy of the PowerPoint from today's session.